Good morning. The uh, committee will come to order. I appreciate you all being here for this uh, uh, oversight uh, hearing, uh, part number two, uh, regarding the TSA uh, airport perimeter screening. I would like to welcome the Ranking Member Tierney and members of the subcommittee and members of the audience who are here and participating with those and those of you that are, are watching on television. Today's proceedings are the second in a series of hearings designed to evaluate the status of U.S. airport security and the policies employed by the Department of Homeland Security. There are a number of concerns that have been highlighted and will be drawn out here today. First and foremost, we have uh, uh, learned that there have been 25,000 security breaches at U.S. airports since November of 2001, and I do appreciate the TSA in tracking and providing that data, but obviously those are the ones we know about. And the deep concern is what about the ones we don't know about and the creativity and things that can happen in the future. We also are deeply concerned about the TSA failing to conduct conduct threat vulnerability assessments in order to identify gaps in perimeter screening. In 2009, the GAO had concluded there were 87 percent of these airports had not had these threat assessments done, and that number really has not changed. TSA also lacks a national strategy to secure commercial airports and access controls. This, again, coming from a GAO report that says that the Nation's 457 commercial airports have not, quote, been guided by a unifying national strategy, end quote. Also concerned about more than 900,000, 900,000 security badges at these 457 airports and the dangers that that can lead to and the challenges that that presents. We are also concerned about what is happening at, the, at some of our Nation's airports. For instance, at JFK, the investigative reports show that at least Quote, a quarter mile of the perimeter fence is down, leaving a gaping hole in security along a main JFK runway. End quote. This project is four years behind its schedule. Also concerned about what happened at Dallas Love Field. The fence has been breached or damaged almost 20 times in less than five years. In fact, air traffic control tapes show that pilots on the ground were unsure of what to do when a pickup truck crashed through a fence and drove onto the tarmac on August 19, 2010. One of the pilots inquired, quote, Tower, what is the protocol for something like this? If he is coming at us, can we move? Airport Control Tower responded, quote, just hold position, end quote. We are also concerned about what is happening at LAX. The eight miles of fence there have built in stages over the past decade, and yet no one consistent standard has happened. We have spent nearly, we will have spent nearly $500 million on, on uh, AIT machines. I call them the whole body imaging machines. Uh, by the time we get to the year two, uh, 2013. And yet they, these machines, there are parts and gaps in that security that don't work. I happen to believe that there is a better, smarter way to do this that is more secure, less invasive. And uh, we are going to hear some testimony today in talking about the K-9 units and what they are able to do. And I look forward to hearing that testimony. We are also concerned that uh, these AIT machines or, or whole body imaging machines would have not found some of the weapons that were uh, attempted to be used on December in the December 2009 incident. And the list goes on. TSA has spent millions and millions of dollars on technology that has not worked. You remember the 2000, 207 puffer machines, after spending $30 million and having those deployed, those were put back on the shelf. The challenge before us is great. It is immense. It is real. We have to deal with that threat and security, uh, threat to our nation. It is not going to go away. There is no end to the uh, uh, creativity of terrorists. And while I have heard uh, press recounts say that, well, let's remember that the 25,000 security breaches are 1 percent or even less than 1 percent, unfortunately, we have to be right all the time. Terrorists only have to get lucky once. A lot of what we have been participating here, in my personal opinion, has been security theater and has not truly done the job to secure the airports to the degree that we need to. And I think one of the personal challenges that we have as a nation is how do we become more secure and yet less invasive, that we don't give up every personal liberty in the name of security. And we have to find that proper balance. It is a difficult one knowing that the threat is real. So I look forward to this hearing today. We are going to also, um, uh, and so uh, rather than wax on, I would love to hear from the panel. But at this time, I would like to recognize the ranking member uh, of this uh, subcommittee, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank our witnesses for being here this morning as well. Uh, look, we, un we understand that we are going to address some important issues here today, and one of them, for instance, is the uh, screening passenger observation techniques, or the SPOT program. Our General Accountability Office has uh, criticized that SPOT program, saying that it lacks appropriate scientific validation. 
The Department of Homeland Security has released a study that it says shows SPOT is more effective than random screening, but it does acknowledge that it didn't address whether behavioral analysis is actually an effective way to detect potential terrorists. Now, they have spent $750 million on it already. They are asking for another $250 million. I think it is pretty critical that we, um, with that significant investment out there, that we take a good look and scrutinize whether or not this program actually is effective in identifying potential threats to uh, security. We are also going to discuss, this, discuss the screening of checked baggage using the explosive detection technology. Congress mandated 100 percent screening of checked bags by the Transportation Security Agency, but it has been slow to implement those standards at airports across the country. Again, the General Accountability Office said that despite the regulations being in effect in 2005, the expositive detection technology uh, requirements weren't put in place until 2009. Turning to the issue of perimeter security, there have been some high-profile breaches that we are all aware of. Specifically, we will hear today about a tragic incident that occurred just outside of Boston's Logan Airport, where a young man fell from a plane as it approached the airport for landing. According to news reports, he likely gained access to the plane after breaching airport perimeter security in Charlotte. This is not a unique incident, unfortunately. We have also heard about the uh, serial security breaches by Mr. Ronald Wong, who was somehow able to make it onto a plane leaving JFK Airport in New York for San Francisco with a stolen boarding pass. The General Accountability Office has also raised concerns about perimeter security at our nation's airports. In 2009, they found the TSA had failed to implement a national strategy to address perimeter security, and that only a small percentage of airports had completed joint vulnerability assessments. This again raises serious questions that have to be addressed. So as we evaluate these incidents and the challenges, it is probably important for us to take the time to understand what security functions the Transportation Security Administration is not directly responsible for, and one of those is the perimeter area. They are not principally responsible uh, for perimeter security at airports. That perimeter security is primarily the responsibility of airport operators, while TSA's role is to ensure that the operator is adhering to an appropriate security plan that meets Federal standards. So, as I said at the last hearing on TSA, the agency has a difficult and unenviable task, but it is our responsibility, our role, to provide constructive criticism with which you with TSA can strike the balance between security, convenience and cost, hopefully weighing heavily on the security aspect. I hope our hearing today can help TSA do just that, and I thank the Chairman again for bringing us together. Thank you. We will now recognize the Chairman of the Transportation Committee and also a member of the subcommittee, uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Tierney, for your leadership and also uh, pursuing um, very important uh, issues relating to transportation security and uh, holding a uh, very important agency accountable. Uh, having been involved uh, with uh, TSA and actually picked the name for the agency and helped craft uh, its uh, enabling legislation. Some 10 years ago, I have had a chance to monitor its activities closely. and um, Unfortunately, I have become more and more concerned with the uh, billions of dollars that are being expended. Uh, some of it just astounds me. Uh, we have created an agency that is uh, uh, actually uh, run pell-mell pell away from security and turned into a huge, unthinking, uh, non-risk-based uh, bureaucracy. Uh, everywhere I turn, I am appalled at what is taking place. I recently had the opportunity to go to our state capital, Tallahassee, and I left the uh, airport to pick up a rental car. and. Uh, the airport is located on about a 16-foot embankment that uh, actually is an embankment across the entire length of the airport. Here is the front of the airport. Here is the embankment, 16 feet high. And just to show you, we are talking about airport security and perimeters, uh, how idiotic uh, we could be in implementation of uh, any requirement like this, but this is the parking space for rental cars. This is a 16-foot embankment. You can see up here where cars go through the entrance of the airport. 
Now, there's a new airport administrator. He wasn't familiar with all of the details, but we're going we're gonna to do a thorough investigation of this. Uh, this, uh, this is just one instance, again, of a non-thinking agency. I don't know of any, de any explosive device that could possibly penetrate 16 feet here, except maybe a nuclear weapon. Uh, I don't know how much it costs to put these barriers here, uh, but again, uh, forcing a small airport, uh, or if TSA paid for it, an idiotic expense, not to, not to mention the cost to the taxpayer or the airport, but then, uh, of course, they would never consider the economic loss to the car rental uh, firm or to the revenue of the airport. But every time, everywhere I turn, I see uh, a disregard for the taxpayer. This is just one instance in one small community. Um, again, just a, an unthinking agency. Their budget is, what, in the $8 billion range? Um, then I opened the paper a week or two ago when I returned to Washington, and I look at this, pay, this uh, ad. Now, of course, the Humane Society is looking for a Vice President of Federal Affairs, and they have a little, uh, I'd say it's about a sixth of a page. But we have a four-color, half-page ad for a Deputy Assistant Administrator for Legislative Affairs in this and other Capitol uh, Hill publications. Half-page. Only total disregard for taxpayers' resources could you expend money on uh, whether, whether it's a venture like this at my state capitol airport or in a Capitol Hill publication. And, uh, I'm going to request, too, uh, an accounting for uh, expenditure of this money. And let me just tell TSA, too, that if you uh, refuse to cooperate with my committee, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, uh, I, I have had and will continue to have the cooperation of both this subcommittee on which I serve and the full committee, Mr. Issa, uh, and uh, the chairman here have agreed to cooperate to get this information. And we will get the data, whether it's this or other, um, other activities such as um, that you've refused to provide information uh, to us on uh, regarding your expenditure of uh, of uh, your national deployment force where you can't hire people or people leave their jobs and you have to fly them in, put them up at uh, uh, hotels, uh, pay their expenses and pay them a per diem, um, uh, whether it's that issue or uh, more than a dozen pending items, we will get the information, we will investigate, we'll, we will protect the taxpayers who are paying the bulk of the expenses for this fiasco. So uh, thank you for holding this uh, hearing. We'll get to some issues uh, and questions uh, in a few minutes, and I yield back. Thank you. We'll now recognize uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Lynch, if you'd like an opening statement. We'll recognize uh, you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, uh, obviously, uh, the, the interest of uh, airport perimeter security is, is a tremendous one for all of us. Um, I know that we have spent enormously uh, on the, the safety and security of the processes within our airports, but this is something that uh, the, the security of our perimeters of, of these airports has become uh, much more of a concern since the uh, fairly recent incidents uh, that involved my district. Uh, the young man who was uh, apparently uh, stood away above uh, on an aircraft uh, uh, recently uh, from, I believe it was South Carolina, to, to Logan Airport in Boston, uh, actually was found deceased in my district, in, in, the, in the town of Milton in my district. Uh, so I, I was able to see up close the, uh, the, the tremendous concern generated by this, the, the hardship on the family, uh, the concerns of all the law enforcement involved as well and uh, obviously the uh, concern within the aviation community. So I think it is, uh, it's, it's worthwhile to, to, to spend some time to redouble our efforts, uh, to focus our resources on, on an area that, that uh, we believe has been neglected. 
And uh, I want to thank the uh, witnesses here for their willingness to come before us to help us with this task, to help the committee, uh, to make sure that, uh, that we're, we're being thorough in our examination, that we're not, not uh, overlooking anything, and that, uh, you know, as a result of this incident and, and some others, that uh, at the end of this process, uh, the American flying public will be safer and our communities will be safer and, and our airports will be more secure. That's the goal here for, for both Democrats and Republicans. That's, that's, uh, that's our intent here. And uh, again, I want to thank the witnesses for coming before this committee to help us with our work. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to now inter introduce uh, our, our panel. Um, uh, so they can uh, be prepared for their, uh, their opening statements. Mr. John Salmon is the Assistant Administrator with the Transportation Security Administration. We do appreciate you being here. Mr. Stephen Lord is the Director of Homeland Security Team at the Government Accountability Office. Mr. Jerry Orr is the Aviation Director at the Charlotte Douglas International Airport. Mr. Rafi Ron is the President of New Age Security Solutions and is the former Director of Security at Tel Aviv Ben Gurion Airport. And in Inspector William Parker is the commander of Amtrak Police Department's K-9 unit. We appreciate you being here as well. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Please uh, rise, if you would, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. In order to allow time for discussion, we would appreciate if you would uh, limit your uh, verbal testimony to five minutes or less. Um, your entire written statement will be entered into the, to the record. So with that, we will start with Mr. Salmon. You are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to be, uh, appear before you today to discuss the Transportation Security Administration's responsibility regarding perimeter security at U.S. commercial airports. I would like to emphasize three points. First, every airport has an individualized security plan of which security, perimeter security is an important piece. Two, airport authorities are responsible for executing the plan. Three, TSA is responsible for approving the plan and inspecting airport compliance with the plan. Unlike checkpoint security, airport authority people and investments play the lead role in carrying out airport perimeter security. TSA conducts airport inspections to enhance security and mitigate risk associated with perimeter integrity, including joint vulnerability assessments, special emphasis inspections, and the testing of access control processes at airports. TSA analyzes the results of these inspections and assessments to develop mitigation strategies that enhance an airport's security posture and to determine if any changes are required. Perimeter-related airport compliance has been inspected 27,031 times over the past 16 months. Every commercial airport receives an annual security assessment to include an assessment of perimeter and access controls. Earlier this year, TSA's Office of Security Operations initiated a special emphasis assessment and special emphasis ins uh, uh, inspection of all airports evaluating perimeter security, including fencing, non-fenced man-made barriers, natural barriers, closed circuit television, electronic intrusion, and motion detection devices. Assessments are complete for the largest airports, with the smaller airports expected to be complete by September 30th of 2011. The results of the inspection were collaborative improvements and also violations, which may result in civil penalties. Going beyond compliance, we work collaboratively with airport operators and airport associations. And in that collaboration, TSA issued updated and improved security guidelines for airport design and construction, as well as an innovative measures report, which highlights best practices from airports of all sizes across the United States. The Innovative Measures Report effort was the first of its kind in working closely with airports across the nation on baselining the best practices in airport perimeter, access control, terminal frontages, and other key areas. 
Over 700 measures and practices from over 100 airports were assessed as part of this groundbreaking initiative. Because of that effort, airports now have a self-assessment module and a resource allocation tool. The tool incorporates attack scenarios, vulnerability scores, consequence scores, and countermeasure success probabilities. It allows airports to baseline their security programs against other airports' innovative measures that will directly inform decisions about improvements to provide the greatest risk, risk reduction for their money at their location. TSA's goal is to work with airport authorities to say, stay ahead of evolving terrorist threats while protecting passengers' privacy and facilitating the efficient flow of travelers and legitimate commerce. TSA's airport perimeter security initiatives are one part of that comprehensive effort. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to discuss this important issue. I am pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. We will now recognize Mr. Lord, who is from the uh, Government Accountability Office, and we will recognize you for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, R Ranking Member Tierney and members of the subcommittee. Thanks for inviting me here today to discuss aviation security issues. The attempted 2009 Christmas Day attack provides a vivid reminder civil aviation remains attractive terrorist target and underscores the importance of today's hearing. Securing commercial aviation operations is difficult given the hundreds of airports, thousands of daily flights with millions of passengers and pieces of checked baggage. The TSA spends several billion dollars each year to help secure the system, however, risks to the system remain. Today, I'd like to discuss three layers of the system. First, TSA's Behavior Detection Program, also called SPOT, Airport Perimeter and Access Controls, and finally, TSA's Check Baggage Screening System. Uh, first, regarding TSA's Behavior Detection Program, uh, T DHS has taken actions to validate the underlying science of the program, but based on our past reporting, more actions are needed. As we reported in May 2010, TSA deployed this program on a nationwide basis without first demonstrating that it was based on uh, valid science. According to TSA, SPOT was deployed before a validation was completed to help address potential threats such as those posed by suicide bombers. Uh, the good news is DHS completed an initial validation study earlier this year and found that the program was more effective than random screening in identifying so-called high-risk passengers. However, as noted in the study, the assessment was just the first step. Additional research is needed, is going to be needed to fully validate the program. And some of the recommendations made in the latest DHS study mirror those we made in our May 2010 report. In some, it's still an open question whether behavior detection principles could be successfully applied on a large scale for counterterrorism purposes in the airport environment. I would now like to discuss some of the key findings from our 2009 report on airport perimeter security. In terms of progress, we noted various steps TSA had made, including implementing the random worker screening program, expanding requirements for name-based background checks, and developing new biometric security standards. However, we found that TSA had not at the time completed a comprehensive risk assessment as called for by DHS. D TSA subsequently completed such an assessment in July 2010. However, the updated assessment did not include an assessment of the in so-called insider threat, which TSA views as a significant threat. The risks posed by insider threats will be included in the next update due later this year. We also recommended that TSA consider making greater use of joint vulnerability assessments. These are a key tool in the TSA toolbox and are completed in conjunction with the FBI. The latest data show TSA has completed joint vulnerability assessments on about 17 percent of uh, the TSA supervised airports, leaving about 83 percent of these airports unassessed. The last point I'd like to discuss is TSA's efforts to deploy check baggage screening equipment. This program is one of the largest acquisition programs within DHS. As highlighted in the report we released to Representative Micah yesterday, TSA has upgraded the explosive detection requirements for this equipment but faces challenges in meeting these requirements. 
The explosive detection requirements for check baggage machines were established in 1998 and subsequently revised in 2005 and 2010 to better address current threats. However, TSA's current check baggage screening systems do not meet the 2010 requirements. Some of the machines are operating at the levels established in 2005. The remainder are operating at levels established in 1998. Our report describes some of the challenges TSA faces in procuring and deploying this very complicated technology. For example, DHS and TSA encounter challenges safely collecting data on the explosives, physical, and chemical properties. Our report contains six recommendations for improving TSA's process for acquiring these sophisticated systems. The good news is that TSA has agreed to take action to implement all six of these recommendations. Mr. Chairman, other distinguished members of the committee, this concludes my statement. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. We will now uh, recognize uh, Mr. Orr. He is the Airport Director and Operator of the Charlotte International Airport. We appreciate you being here, sir, and recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Could Chairman. Please turn on the, yeah, thanks. And maybe move it a little bit closer to you, if you could. The, uh, the microphone, if you can, that would be great. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Jerry Orr, and I am the Aviation Director for the City of Charlotte uh, at the Charlotte Airport. I have worked for 36 years in airport management and was a small business owner for 13 years before that. I am here today to testify on airport perimeter security. I have been critical of the performance of the TSA since its inception. I am not critical of its mission. I am critical of its measures. In my judgment, the effectiveness of the TSA is compromised by a rigid attitude of arrogance and bureaucracy. In November of last year, the body of a young man was discovered in Milton, Massachusetts and was thought to have fallen from an aircraft. I learned about a possible connection to Charlotte in the media and therefore reached out to our Federal Security Director. He did not want TSA to take the lead and instead recommended I ask our Municipal Police Department to head up an investigation and TSA would assist them. Ultimately, the available evidence could neither prove nor disprove that a security breach had actually occurred at Charlotte. The police and TSA theorized how the young man may have accessed an aircraft. They came up with a reasonable assumption about what might have happened that excludes entry through a checkpoint. But the report fails to acknowledge that they could not conclusively rule out this possibility because TSA had failed to preserve their surveillance video of the checkpoints and some of it was lost. I am not saying that the young man came through a TSA checkpoint. What I am saying is that the TSA failed to even admit the possibility and deflected attention elsewhere. This mentality serves to protect the agency at the cost of real security needs. The investigation focused national attention on airport perimeter security. In Charlotte, we have 19 miles of six-foot-high chain-link fence with three strands of barbed wire enclosing the airport. This fence meets all Federal requirements. We spend a half million dollars annually on maintaining the fence, all from the airport budget. We spend an additional $3 million on 75 personnel with perimeter security responsibilities. The fence is a deterrent. It says, keep out. However, the final line of security is the eyes and ears of the 20,000 people uh, who work inside the fence. TSA seems to believe that airports are automatically in violation of the regulations even when they did everything they were obligated to do, and it simply didn't work. To me, that is like saying that Customs and Border Protection itself is violating the law each time an illegal alien crosses into the United States. Other examples of TSA's lack of a partnership. We recently asked TSA to explain their security basis and their legal authority for directing us to do something. But TSA failed or refused to respond or even acknowledge our questions. TSA has conflicting roles in operational and regulatory capacities that are not kept separate. Having an agency interpret the rules, implement actions, and then judge their effectiveness lends itself to the possibility of abuse. 
I am confident that I am not the only airport operator with significant concerns about the effectiveness of TSA. An adversarial relationship between airports and the very agency entrusted to help safeguard them is clearly detrimental to the goal of safety and security. So what can be done to improve our ability to focus on the real needs of our Nation's airports? Congress should continue to support its support of allowing airports to opt out of using TSA and ensure that the bureaucracy does not throw up arbitrary roadblocks to discourage us from pursuing this alternative. Any entity working with airports and airlines to achieve security must do just that, work with them. TSA's current because I say so culture does not foster respect. I also believe Congress should redirect some of the available funding for airport security from TSA directly to airports. The operators most familiar with the airport's vulnerabilities and strengths and is well equipped to make effective enhancements. Safety and security are always our number one priority. There can always be more security, but the challenge is to provide better security. We need to spend money where it counts on things that matter. The path forward to optimal security needs to be reasonable and collaborative. If airports are given the resources we need and a true partner for security, the traveling public will be the beneficiary. Thank you, Mr. Orr. We will now recognize Mr. Rafi Ron, the former Director of Security at Tel Aviv's Ben Gurion Airport. Mr. Ron, you are recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for inviting me to uh, testify today. Uh, I would like to uh, draw the committee's attention to um, a, um, a three uh, factors that I believe um, they are playing a key role in um, a, uh, many of the shortcomings a, uh, in airport security. Um, the first one is the imbalance that was created uh, shortly after 9-11 when TSA um, had the overwhelming uh, task of um, recruiting, uh, training, and installing technology um, the, uh, in airports the, uh, around the country, something that uh, has turned to be the backbone of, the, um, of TSA's uh, operation and influence over security at the airports. At the same time, the airport facility security has received much less attention um, and um, a, uh, not only that um, a, uh, a screening of passengers and bags where most of the attention and um, the funding uh, went into, uh, but it was also executed the, uh, according to the law by TSA while the rest of it was left for the uh, local authorities uh, to take care of. Um, funding was relatively short. Um, the, uh, the standards a, uh, for um, a performance a, uh, of the security task on the local level um, a, uh, a, uh, are not a, uh, very clear and in many cases a, uh, do not even exist. Um, and um, a, uh, the point of um, a, or the issue a, of perimeter security is a very good example for that. Because um, I think that the, uh, traveling around the country, um, one can easily notice that, first of all, there is very little consistency um, the, uh, in our airports as far as perimeter security is concerned. Secondly, most of, the airp of our airports today are still not protected by um, the, uh, an operating uh, perimeter intrusion detection systems. In other terms, we don't know when a breach occurs. Um, the, uh, we get to know that only when it is addressed by somebody or when a, uh, we end up with a stowaway um, a, uh, a, uh, making his way to the wheel well and a, uh, sadly enough uh, losing his life um, a, um, a after takeoff. And obviously um, a, uh, this is not a, um, a, a good reasonable standard compared to those that we implement a, uh, on the uh, passenger and bag a screening a operation. Uh, the other aspect of that is that the issue of jurisdiction is not very clear. When it comes to uh, the uh, security operation, security facility or a, uh, operation at the airport, um, by law it is the local law enforcement a, uh, uh, agency or department that is responsible to do that. But yet most or many of the um, police departments 
that they provide that service in airports are still implementing <clears throat> their role uh, more as a law enforcement agency rather than a security agency. And there is a major difference between the two. Um, and once again, if you look at perimeter as a reflection of this problem, you can see that the role that the uh, local police department is taking on perimeter security at airports is minimal and is usually based on responding to calls rather than on a um, early detection and a, um, a, a prevention. So um, a, um, I think that there are two areas that st still needs to, um, a, 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 to receive much more attention. One is the, uh, the, um, a, the role and the funding of the local a, uh, authorities as far as the airport facility uh, security is concerned. And secondly, uh, the need for standards that will create consistent high-level uh, performance uh, that will uh, um, characterize the security uh, in airports around the country. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ron. A little bit of uh, explanation here as we uh, introduce Inspector Parker. Um, you may, may be curious as to why we would invite uh, somebody from Amtrak, uh, Amtrak Police, uh, to be here at, uh, at, at a hearing uh, regarding airport security. Uh, one of the questions I think that is a legitimate one that this uh, committee would like to explore is, while the TSA has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in whole body imaging machines and technology, there are those, particularly at the Pentagon, that have come to the conclusion that dogs are the single best way uh, to uh, 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 find explosive devices. I would like to ask unanimous consent to inter introduce into the record uh, there was a press conference uh, by Lieutenant General Michael Oates. He says, uh, quote, dogs are the best detectors. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I would point to this, I know all good Americans get this magazine, Airmen, which is the magazine of the United States Air Force. Uh, in their May-June uh, 2011 edition, this little pull-out quote here says, there is no technology proven more effective in the detection of explosives than the canine. And yet there, there are questions as to are we investing enough in technology that we know that works in canines, according to the Pentagon, having spent te literally tens of billions of dollars? So again, without waxing on too much more, we do truly appreciate Inspector Parker uh, being here. And it is just a bit of explanation. He is going to give a bit of testimony, and then we are going to have a demonstration. Now, don't let anybody in here worry anybody in here, but uh, I will let him explain how we are going to conduct this. We would just ask that anybody here in the audience stay put, and if you have some sort of, you know, something. Um, <laughs> we are glad that you are here, Inspector Parker. So, uh, but we are going to do a, a bit of a demonstration. We just ask that you kind of hang tight while we do this demonstration and appreciate the leeway uh, here of the committee as, as we do this demonstration. Inspector Parker will give you great leeway. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Tierney. My name is William Parker and I am the Inspector Commander of the Amtrak Police Department's K-9 Unit. I am honored to be here today and I appreciate the invitation to speak with you about what dogs can do to improve airport security and detect explosives. A well-trained dog is more capable, useful, reliable and effective than equipment. Dogs do not depreciate like machinery do. If dogs are trained properly and if their training is consistent, their skill level will increase with experience. Perimeter security is of great concern to airports and the Transportation Administration Many airports rely on surveillance beams and cameras to protect their perimeter. The problem is if nothing appears on the camera after the alarm goes off, you can't just assume nothing is there. Someone has to respond and make sure no one is hiding from the camera. A well-trained law enforcement officer with a well-trained patrol dog can find and address that threat immediately without waiting for backup. On and after September 11, 2001, we used explosive dogs intensively to sweep airport terminals. The dogs were used to sweep for explosives in the morning before the terminal opened and in the evening when the terminal closed. I saw a real surge in interest in canines' capability after 9-11. As people realized dogs were effective in crowded environments where their explosive screening abilities were better in crowds than technology. At Amtrak, trains are randomly swept for explosives before boarding. We keep an explosive team present at the boarding gates to provide a detection capability and immediate response. I think a dog on a jetway at boarding would improve security at no inconvenience to travelers and would provide an elevated sense of security. 
Dogs are very effective, not only in detecting explosives, but as a deterrent in many environments, any environments, when deployed properly. Amtrak has many challenges as airports authorities, particularly the need to use the need to secure open space areas that intruders could use to come into our property. We have been able to implement some new procedures that could, use, that could be used in airports. I have helped pioneer a new application of K-9 called VaporWake. VaporWake is a trained dog smell to, wave, to smell the wake of explosives and material in the air after a person passed by that area. Amtrak is working with Auburn University and other agencies to develop this application, and other agencies such as TSA are starting to use VaporWake K-9 methods. In closing, I would like to reiterate my position that a good canine program is an excellent investment for any agency that needs to secure high traffic areas or facility perimeter, provided the program is properly funded and supported with a strong infrastructure. To this point, I have brought two teams with me to give a, give, to give a brief demonstration. After we conclude the demo, I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. And thank you again for this opportunity. What you are going to see in this demo, sir, is that I explained to you about VaporWake technology. The dog will be able to detect people that walk by. It is not intrusive. They will not stop anybody's path. You are going to see two from my right, your left. We are going to have people come through the door. As you see, the dog is like pretending she is at a checkpoint. People are going to come in and the dog is going to be able to detect who came in with something on them. <laughs> We're just waiting on the crowd of people. These are your staffers. As you see, sir, the dog is not intrusively hurting anybody. He's walking. As you see now, that's a hit. As you see that person walk by, the dog is walking, walking. Stop decoy. As you see, this is a response that the dog would give. And that's a person, and this individual has ankle weights on to have explosives on his ankle. So you can look at him physically and not say anything, but he has about five pounds of explosive on his ankle. Could you show the uh, committee, sir? And in that is smokeless powder. All right. Second demonstration we're going to give. Okay, you can move. Second demonstration we're going to give is, like I say, when a person passed through an area. To <laughs> <laughs> That's Levi Chocolate Lab. As a person passed through an area, you'll see a person walking through your room right there, over there to your left. She's going to walk and sit down. We're going to have a dog come through that same area. That person has already sat down. The dog is going to come in and follow the scent where the dog person walked to and uh, determine where she's located at. They're just trying to give it a little bit of time because, in theory, it's been known that somebody can walk through the area and 15 minutes after they have passed through, the dog can still pick that up. And that's a scientific fact that's already been noted. And that's Zeta coming in.
Good girl. Let's give the dogs a hand of applause, sir. Again, I want to thank you for this opportunity and uh, any questions you may have. Thank you. Very impressive. Appreciate it. Uh, we're, I'm now going to recognize myself for five minutes as we move to the questioning. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, I, I want to start with Mr. Salmon here and uh, the GAO. GAO, uh, in the report that is released uh, out today, uh, it is uh, dated today, uh, page 12 and 13, it says, Our analysis of TSA data show that from fiscal year 2004 through to July 1, 2011, TSA conducted GVAs, or Joint Vulnerability Assessments, at about 17 percent of TSA regulated airports that existed at the time, thus leaving about 83 percent of airports unassessed. How can that be? In 2009, September 2009, there was a report issued saying that 87 percent of the airports haven't been assessed. And over that time frame, we have now only got moved that number to 17 percent assessment? The joint vulnerability assessments are done in concert with the FBI. Uh, they are done, uh, they are extensive assessments. They are done in a limited number of locations. But every single commercial airport receives an annual security assessment. But wait, wait, why aren't there 100 percent JVAs done, joint vulnerability assessments? TSA, with TSA, all, is, is the goal not to get to 100 percent? TSA does complete security assessments, including the perimeter of all airports every year, including we have done 27,000 inspections. I am asking about the joint vendor. There, I recognize there are different right, assessments. There are, yeah, there are different assessments, and it is a different it, assessment. What is your goal? When we, are, are you, do you have I, the goal of getting to 100 percent, yes or we no? We will not get to 100 percent of 450 airports with the FBI every year, no. It, not even every year, it, at some point. I mean, it, Okay. Mr. Lord, you have looked into this. What, what were your findings in this particular area? When we first looked at it, the uh, number was actually uh, 13 percent. Uh, that was from the 2004-2008 timeframe, and uh, we asked TSA for some updated analysis. So that numbers have actually gone up. It is now uh, 17 percent. These are very uh, intensive examinations uh, focused on high-risk airports. And they, TSA considers them the gold standard. They, they obviously conduct a whole host of other activities and in inspections and testing. I mean, there's quite a few things they do. But, you know, we thought this was uh, worthwhile to single out given the significance. We do recognize, you know, they're difficult to do quickly and you have to get the FBI involved. So it's, what, what, what I don't understand is given the imperative, given the knowledge and understanding that we are only as strong as the weakest link, and it may be that small airport, as we saw on 9 11, when, when that person got on a plane, not at one of the major, major airports initially, and got into the system, got behind the security line. Why is the TSA not demanding and working towards getting to 100 percent? I don't understand. There are 457 airports. Why aren't 457 airports? getting this JVA done? This level of assessment will be done with a limited number of airports. Not all airports will be done. They will have inspections and they will have a complete assessment I just, every I, year. I, I just I absolutely don't understand that. I, I, I don't understand. I think it is unacceptable. Let me move on. Uh, Mr. Orr, in your testimony, you said that the uh, TSA has yet to approve his airport security program. Quote, I think you said in your testimony, quote, we have been trying to get revisions to our for to our approval for about a year now. Can you explain that a little bit more, please? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. We, uh, we are required to amend our uh, security plan anytime there is a change in our security procedures. And uh, we submitted a, an amendment to uh, the local Federal Security Director uh, over a year ago, heard nothing for six or seven months. Uh, got a comment, uh, addressed that comment, it again lay idle for a couple of months. And then our uh, assistant security director that we had been working with disappeared and, and a new one appeared, uh, and then the process started all over. Mr. Salmon, do you care to respond to that? Uh, yes, as I understand the request to rewrite, uh, to uh, change the, uh, amend the security plan, uh, was in progress, was initiated uh, uh, about a year ago. There was a joint vulnerability assessment with the FBI conducted in the fall of 2010. 
It's my understanding, and I don't know this personally, but it's my understanding the parties agreed to let's hold off on completing the rewriting the airport security plan until we understand the results of the joint vulnerability assessment. Now, the joint vulnerability assessment, in terms of its analysis of perimeter security, was not particularly flattering. Uh, and so in terms of where the, uh, the, uh, the amendment is, in terms of rewriting it, I think both parties agreed. Well, it sounds like he's been waiting for a year. Well, he, if you dispute you, that? Both parties agreed to wait until something you brought up last time is a joint vulnerability assessment. And that was an input. That should be very insightful in terms of what you do with your security plan. Mr. Orr? We have had two joint uh, vulnerability assessments, one in 2007 and one in 2010. At, uh, at the conclusion of each one, we asked for uh, additional information, help us understand what you are talking about here. And uh, in both cases have not received that. We submitted our, our plan, our amendment. We heard nothing. We checked on it a couple of times. They said it was in the works. And this is the frustration. You are telling me that you have no goal to get to 100 percent of joint vulnerability assessments on the 450 uh, uh, airports. You made improvement from 13 percent to 17 percent. And then we have an airport where you have done a, G a JVA, a joint vulnerability assessment, and you are not getting their responsiveness. These need to be collaborative efforts. You got people all over across the country. You are supposed to be in the, ex the expert in the middle of this. That is the concern. My time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman, Mr. Tierney, from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lord, uh, this joint vulnerability assessment, what is your analysis of how uh, likely it is that uh, 100 percent uh, of the airports could uh, undergo that particular scrutiny every year? Well, uh, we don't think it would be appropriate to do every year, but perhaps on a rolling basis. That is how they do now. They have a target within a three-year uh, Time frame. They try to focus out, you know, complete JVAs on the high risk airports. It's a matter of resources. Right. Obviously, they are expensive. You need to get the FBI's cooperation. So, so currently, they are in a three year rolling plan to do 100 percent of the high risk airports within that time frame. That's, that would be difficult to achieve under the current process. I, I, perhaps, I would defer to Mr. Uh, Salmon on that. He, he would know more about that. But, I was, but your understanding that is the plan? It's not the plan. It's, it's, the plan. Uh, it, it's uh, as Mr. Salmon stated, the current goal is not to do 100 percent. Uh, my point is they do them on a rolling three-year basis. So, Mr. Salmon, how many of those uh, high-risk airports would be done on the rolling three-year uh, three basis? Yeah, I'd have to get back to our operations people and get you an answer, and I'm sure we'd be happy to respond to the committee on that. Uh, would, would it be close to 100 percent? Would it be 50 percent? Would it be 25 percent? Uh, I would have to check with the FBI to see where the FBI and We need FBI cooperation. It's not a TSA event. Uh, getting FBI resources, review of the project, uh, sign off, uh, and so on and so forth. It's not a TSA. Uh, uh, we don't uh, run this thing by ourselves. Okay. Uh, Mr. Salmon, let me, while we're talking about the, the screening passenger uh, observation techniques program, the SPOT program. Can you differentiate that from the, uh, from the usual type of random search? Um, yes. Essentially, I think uh, your other witness on the panel, Mr. Ron, is, a, is an expert in this. Um, but what you are looking for are microfacial anomalies in terms of the way people are, are behaving, particularly uh, the kind of facial movements they have uh, as they approach the checkpoint. Um, this spot program has, arrest, has resulted in more than 2,000 arrests since 2006, again, for people who had perhaps criminal uh, the, um, and other kinds of fraudulent or illegal activity that they were engaged in. But the science is based upon microfacial uh, uh, anomalies in the way that people look, and that's what they're trained to. Um, so it's it's more than random. You're looking for people. You're looking at the crowd, uh, looking for people who have, uh, in that context, somewhat aberrant uh, aberrant looks. Mr. Ron, we're about a billion dollars into this, or three quarters of a billion dollars, and the other quarter being asked for. Is that worth the money? Yes, I think that the. <clears throat> I think that the, uh, the investment in the, um, the behavior observation um, the, uh, certainly makes sense because all the rest of what we are doing is very much limited to detection of items. Um, and I think a, um, 10 years after 9-11, with the um, attempted attacks a, uh, that we had during this period of time, 
um, we uh, reached the conclusion that uh, uh, we need to spend more attention on people rather than uh, uh, just on items. And um, the uh, observing behavior is one of the basic tools um, that uh, can be used at the airport, but obviously it is only one single tool in a much wider and more complex uh, uh, strategy. What kind of technology is involved in the SPOT program? Well, uh, yeah, it depends on the way do you define technology. Um, the, um, the, if we are looking at technology from the point of view of um, the machines that are involved uh, or computers that are involved in the process, uh, this is not a highly technological process. This is more a human-based uh, process. Uh, but there's certainly room to expand that into the uh, technological area by use of surveillance um, the technology, uh, and I mean smart surveillance technology, not just cameras out there, but those that can identify uh, certain types of events or behavior, and they uh, help us uh, respond to it in, uh, in real time. So at the granular level, it could be done just with trained human beings uh, exercising the, uh, the process that, uh, that's involved? Well, right now, it is mostly training human beings. Yeah. Well, I would imagine the, you know, if you start getting remote possibilities in there and technology for that, the cost would be enormous when you are talking about all the airports that are around. Yeah, this is correct. <coughs> uh, Mr. Orr, I just want to just quickly, you talked about having the local um, entity be able to opt out of TSA on that. And, and if your organization did that, would you be willing to take the full responsibility and liability for uh, failures to succeed? Yes, sir. I have that anyway. All right. Good. Yield back. Thank you. Now I uh, recognize the uh, Chairman of the Transportation Committee, Mr. Micah of Florida. Thank you, uh, Mr. Salmon. Um, you have, as of last week, uh, my figures are you had 3,905 uh, people uh, in Washington uh, supposedly working for TSA, um, and, and 27 percent of them were in it. At, supervisory and administrative capacities, making on average all of them uh, 100, over $104,000. How many of those folks were dedicated to doing the uh, vulnerability assessments that we have been talking about here? Uh, in terms of the vulnerability assessment, I would say a limited number, but we can get you um, the numbers. I mean, I don't know, sir. A dozen, half a dozen. I'd have to get back. I'd like to give you a truthful answer. Okay, so good. I'd, well, fine. could you provide that to the committee? I'd be happy to do that. Then next, you have 9,656 administrative personnel uh, out in the field, uh, how many of those folks are uh, involved in the uh, vulnerability assessment? Those are administrative people, not screeners. I would have to get you the same answer in terms of respect, responding uh, to the committee. Okay. And they are having trouble getting back with uh, people like Mr. Orr, I see, because the FBI and other agencies don't cooperate. That is your uh, explanation today? No, sir. I, in terms of the ASP, I will look into it. I am not personally familiar you with the You could not possibly plan. have an FSD or some of the people who are making over $100,000. And maybe you could give for the record the number of people who are making over $100,000 at Mr. Orr, Orr's airport. Um, uh, none of those people could check off on a security uh, plan uh, for the per to protect the per perimeter of the Charlotte airport. Uh, if you set the protocols uh, and standards in Washington. The, uh, the plan is worked out locally with the airport director and the FSD, and it is approved uh, through Washington. But it takes sir. six months to even get a response. Uh, well, I, th I think the JVA. I mean, um, can't you understand that, that down, frustration? Sir. The other thing, Mr. War, too, if anyone contacts you and, and there is any intimidation after you are testifying here today or any indication that they are giving you a hard time in any way, I want you to let this committee know immediately. Yes, sir. I've, I've seen the way these people operate, the intimidation, and uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, you're, you're pretty brave to be with us today. Um, what's the current uh, uh, most serious uh, risk that we face? I think right now, in terms of uh, non-metallic explosives on airplanes coming in from overseas. Uh, okay, that's a, that, that's a good point. Uh, actually. Mr. Pistol said uh, way back in November 2010 that we were in risk management uh, 
business being a risk-based, intelligent organization. That's what he's trying to achieve, and I support that goal. Do, do we have a plan from TSA you could share with us to move towards that? I don't have a plan today, but I would recommend the committee work with Administrator Pistol. Uh, he's number Can two. Can you provide us with the, an update from him on where you go? No, I can where just tell you. Where are you going with that uh, risk-based plan? I will tell you that he is working on a number of uh, uh, alternatives, okay. and he uh, hopes to announce something soon this summer. But we're looking forward to that. Um, and you mentioned that most of the risk is coming in from out of the United States. For example, Orly uh, was the shoe bomber, Mr. Reed, Amsterdam, the diaper Christmas Day bomber, the London liquid, uh, the Yemen uh, ton uh, toner. Uh, last count I had, uh, well, we had under 100 uh, TSA personnel overseas. Uh, it was really 54 when I checked. Do you know what the number is now? I don't know off the top of my head. You know, have if you've had any you. contact with the Secretary of State or others in, in um, trying to uh, uh, increase the presence of TSA overseas? Uh, we work with overseas countries. Could we you have provide people. the latest contacts with the uh, Department of State and others uh, uh, to the committee on, uh, because you said the threat's coming from there. Now, the whole uh, body imaging uh, equipment, which we spent a half a billion dollars on, uh, and uh, the deployment, of the, I mean, we're probably in the billion dollar range. Uh, at this March 16th uh, hearing, I asked the question, uh, um, we know that terrorists are moving to body cavity inserts and surgical implants. Does the whole body imaging uh, equipment direct this kind of uh, uh, tension? Can it, can it detect this kind of threat? The answer from all of them, uh, the experts, was yeah. it d does not. Uh, I, it, it, it will depend, and I can't discuss it in this setting, but it's classified. Happy to have a classified okay, well, that, update. They said it did not. Yeah. Um, now, uh, we've known since uh, this is a BBC News release uh, from um, 2009, September 2009, that terrorists were now moving. In fact, they used a, a, a bomb on a terrorist implanted and uh, blew up in front of a Saudi prince, killed himself. Um, I, I uh, mentioned this back in, what's the date, March? And, uh, that, that appears to be a threat, that they're moving. Obviously, they've gone from shoes to diaper to liquid to ca cartridges. Wouldn't you say that it looks like the body implant might be a way to go? I dispute that BBC report, but again, I can't discuss it in here. I'll be doing a classified no, I mean, setting. There's no dispute. He blew, the, he blew the crap out of the guy. Sir, sir the, the, the okay. I'm just well, happy right. to discuss it in the classified Well, in setting. any event, uh, and I, I mentioned this, and uh, it was also mentioned that the, the equipment we spent a billion dollars on can't do anything about it. And TSA uh, finally gets July 6th. TSA recently bur briefed air carriers and foreign partners to provide greater, greater insights into intelligence indicating it could cue interest as uh, terrorist, terrorists to target aviation. Uh, that, uh, and uh, they na main name specifically the threat of uh, body uh, implants as a threat. Is that something you issued? I'd be happy to discuss the specifics of that in the classified setting, sir. I mean, you can't tell me that you... you we have, have spoken with the airlines and talked to them about security procedures. So it took yes, you to sir. July to uh, finally um, tell them, or did you tell them that this might pose a threat before we, that? We've been working on non-metallic threats for the airlines for a considerable period of time, and uh, this specific threat was based on specific intelligence that was... And most gathered. of the testing has, uh, of that equipment, both by this committee, GA, uh, uh, directed by GAO, uh, has uh, been unsuccessful, uh, both in reports uh, that have been published um, and also in GAO reports that also look at your backup system, which is uh, the SPOT program, uh, which they termed uh, almost a total failure. I think uh, Mr. Ron... In, in addressing this risk. Uh, no, I, 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 I totally disagree with you in terms of what you're looking for are other alternatives to get around technology as people tend to, to mm -hmm. try to design. Are you aware of, of the, the uh, hearing that was conducted by the Science and Technology Committee where Mr. Uh, Brown from Georgia, the chairman, uh, questioned the uh, use, the current uh, application of uh, uh, standoff be behavior detection, which you employ now, versus the, uh, the um, uh, active uh, 
questioning which is done uh, under the Israeli system? I think they're both very good. Well, uh, the, uh, everyone who testified, every expert said the TSA uh, current procedure is a, is a total failure, and uh, they uh, v further validated the findings of GAO. I'm not familiar with the witnesses. Uh -huh. no, and again, I had the opportunity two weeks ago to be in um, Tel Aviv at Ben Gurion Airport to see how it was done. And it can be done on an interactive basis, even with a large population, if we go to risk base rather than hassling uh, innocent Americans, uh, veterans, military, children, um, and people who pose absolutely no risk. Yield back the balance of my time. So I would encourage you to speak to work with Administrator Pistol. Thank you. We try. We, you know, we try to get the senior most people to come before this committee, and they refuse. I mean, that is one of the great frustrations. That's no surprise to the DSA. I would love to work with them, love to work with them. But that doesn't happen. That's the frustration Mr. of this committee. Mr. Chairman, if yes. they continue just to point a procedure, I would be willing and I will advocate that we do uh, subpoena the appropriate personnel. They send us people like this uh, who cannot provide us with the uh, information. This is the chief investigative committee of the United States House of Representatives. And they're going to appear one way or the other or cooperate one way or the other. And I put them on notice again today. I will now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Ferenthal, for five minutes. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. And I, as uh, sitting on committees that have the most jurisdiction over the TSA, I sit on this committee, Mr. Micah's Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and the Homeland Security uh, Committee. These are issues that deeply concern me in my work of Congress. and. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you all are here. I'm happy to be able to discuss this again. And uh, I'm probably the recipient. Uh, I've gotten more TSA pat-downs since I've been in Congress, and I've gotten pat-downs from my wife. Um, let's, since the uh, topic of this is perimeter security, I wanted to start with uh, that, Mr. Simon. Do you all coordinate? What, to what degree does the uh, TSA coordinate with the FAA, for instance, on spending on airport security. I know in Corpus Christi we recently got about $5 million from the FAA to improve security, but has there been any action with the TSA in determining where the multiple dollars are best spent? Yeah, and I think that's uh, since the GAO reports you've seen come out, a number of things we've been working for several years to address the specific issue you're talking about. First of all, we worked with the airport community to come up with recommended design guidelines for airport planning and construction. A lot of the money the airports use for planning and construction comes from the FAA. Next, we worked with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Homeland Security Institute to develop a best practices uh, from all the airports. I, 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 I'm sorry, I've got a real short amount of time. Yes. Uh, but y y you are saying you are now working regularly with the other, uh, other agencies to make sure the right hand knows what the left hand and of the government is doing. What we are doing is working with the airports. They have a tool. It is a specific uh, computer program. They can run through their system. The idea is to the FSDs to work with the airports to come up with the optimal security spending per airport. It is not the same everywhere. Okay. And you talk about high-risk airport. What is not a high-risk airport when I can get on a commuter jet at any airport uh, in the country and end up at a hub airport and be on the biggest airliner in the world? What would not constitute a critical airport? I agree with you 100 percent. The report we got in terms of the, the 700 innovative measures came from airports as small as Asheville, from, uh, from the, the uh, airports such as Delta County, Minot. So it is a mixture of big airports and small airports that have gotten into best practices in terms of what are the kinds of things that are appropriate for each airport. All right. And again, let me go on to Mr. Lloyd. I apologize for jumping around. I have a lot of questions in a limited amount of time. Uh, you are talking about the spending on, for instance, baggage screening equipment. I will just speak from experience. The airport I use uh, most is the Corpus Christi Airport. We have three airlines, uh, American and Continental with small 50 you know, regional jets and Southwest with 737s. Each individual airline has a screening per, uh, machine staffed by two TSA agents. We bought three machines for the Corpus Christi uh, airport, and there is probably a fourth one because Delta used to come in there. Why couldn't there just be one and a couple of TSA agents? We're, there are never that many people there. Why are we, do we have any clue why we are spending multiple that is a great question. TSA has an electronic uh, baggage screening program which they are trying to move to what they term optimal solutions for each airport 
and essentially what that means, in many cases, they're trying to remove the standalone machines and use more efficient systems or even so-called inline systems, which require less uh, personnel to operate. I'm not sure if that particular airport is on track to get an inline system, but that's something. All right, and let me go to clarify. Mr. Ron for a second. One of the uh, one of the things I hear consist consistently from my constituents, try saying that three times fast, is why don't we follow more of the Israeli model of dealing with people instead of things. The answer I have gotten from a lot of people within our government is Israel only has a couple of airports and not nearly the amount of traffic that we have. Could we implement uh, the Israeli system for a reasonable cost uh, in the United States? Well, first I would like to say that the uh, <clears throat> Israeli solution um, the, um, the, uh, is not really um, an issue when it comes to volume, uh, and I don't think that this is the main consideration. I think that the uh, main consideration is that the Israeli legal, cultural uh, the, uh, environment is very different from the American one, and therefore I would not recommend to uh, adopt the Israeli model as is, but at the same time, I strongly recommend that the concept that is uh, driving the Israeli solution, which is identifying the level of risk of individual passengers and responding to that with a compatible level of search and the uh, interview as, as necessary um, is the right way. And I think that an American solution that would be uh, more compatible to the American environment can and should be developed and implemented. Thank you very much. I am out of time. I am hopeful we will have a second round of questioning because I have got at least five minutes more. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, for five minutes. Thank you. In in Inspector Parker, um, you know, we have spent um, we have deployed 500 advanced imaging technology devices, spent 121 or 122 million on the advanced imaging technology. We have also spent another $30 million on the puffer machines that shoot air blasts at passengers and sniff for explosives, but they rarely work properly. Tell me what the return on investment on dogs is. I mean, I see some, some problems with this because you have to move everybody through these technologies. <coughs> but that animal moves. It, yes, it, it detects, it, it covers a wide range of, 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 of ground. So tell me what the return on investment is. The return on it, is, sir, is mobility. Uh, you don't have to spend money to uh, integrate any new odor to it because a dog is, uh, is a little bit better than machinery because technology. We can introduce odor that you come out, anything new to a dog, and in two or three weeks they proficient at it, as long as you keep that proficiency up. And like I say, you can take the dog to an area versus you got to bring people to an area, as you say. And, and it gives a lot of people a more sense of security when they see a dog, especially they can see a dog working. As you saw the dog was standing there, people walk through, and we do it at Amtrak all the time. People come out on the cellar with that dog at the boarding gate, and people are happy to see him, and it's not intrusive. And the dog is working, and who don't like dogs? <laughs> the person who doesn't like dogs, I don't want to know. <laughs> um, but tell me the average lifetime of, a, of an active canine. Well, like without that. any medical problems, uh, we get a dog at a year old. I like to have the dog work till he's about seven or eight years old. Because after the first two years or so, that's when the dog really gets into his prime. Again, if he's well trained and the proficiency training is there. So you'll get a good five years without adding any. Um, software to them or getting a new breed because something else then came out, we just add it to a dog. We just add it to a scent picture, and that's another odor that he's able to detect and perform. You know, I'm a businessman, so tell me what the cost of, of that uh, of that canine uh, cost is. Well, it ain't the same cost as technology, sir. Hmm, interesting. Would you say a little bit or a lot less? A lot less. And, and you got to understand, dogs, like I say, don't depreciate. If anything, they go up more in value, and they'll be more effective when they get all the training that they need. Now, they're also very keen about uh, detecting behavior, are they not? Yes, sir. And, and, and uh, that's why the vaporwake dogs are very important right now, because they can screen people without them even being known. If you do come to Amtrak, we do it all the time. And I know you know about the rush that comes through our gates. And these dogs screen people, and they keep on going without even being aware they're being searched. Can they just detect um, um, an implant, a, body, a bodily implanted uh, device? Well, sir, scientifically right now there is no data that says a dog can or cannot. 
but given the schematics of a person's body, and you know dogs can detect uh, cancer on people's bodies, tumor, that dogs can detect anything that they're taught. I think if the dog is taught to do that, he'll be a very, very well good asset for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're very innate about picking up uh, uh, differences in how people, uh, as you said earlier. Um, one of the biggest things, Mr. Salmon, I've, I've seen in my limited time on the Hill is, is uncoordination of coordination. Um, in fact, I had to, to put a bill just to, to break down jurisdictional boundaries of two different agencies. So it seems to me like the biggest problem that we have here is, is tell me who the lead is in all this. Who's the, who's the kingpin? Who actually dictates how all um, surveillance or, or uh, a perimeter security should be dictated? Um, as I said in uh, my opening point, TS, the airport, every airport has a plan. The airport's responsible for executing the plan with their people and Who's, their resources. I, I'm going to interrupt you again. Yes, sir. Who's ultimately, that's, that's not it. Um, <clears throat> is it Homeland Security? Who oversees the whole process of all these whole aspects of a perimeter um, surveillance? TSA oversees the plan and inspects the plan. Okay, so you have the jurisdiction to do so. We can, if there are deficiencies in the plan, we can uh, levy fines, uh, civil penalties, yes, sir. So it seems to me like you could ante up all agencies to say on a timely basis that you do this. I mean, I've seen it. And just to give you a quick example, right. um, I've seen a flood, and I've seen a, an agency head from the Forest Service make sure that everybody's lined up in time, in real perspective, without delays. I've seen it happen. Right. So I know it can happen. Right. So it seems to me like the buck stops with you then. So again, what we want to do, and I think one of the things that uh, with GAO is a comprehensive look at what are the vulnerabilities. I'm very aware of what government does. It yes. studies and studies and studies, and by the time you get a study out, it's antiquated. No, sir, we it put seems a like there should, wait a minute, there seems like there should be a minimum standard that's equating all the way across the board. Yes. And it seems like we're missing the point, because I think we need to be using uh, Mr. Ron and Inspector um, uh, Parker's ideas within this because we have to have some minimal standards. And I'm also from Arizona, and so I know that those numbers are not right. I suspect that what, uh, well, and, and just give you a quick example. Well, we're talking about those that you know about, security breaches. There are not the ones that you're not talking about that you don't know anything about. And you can't tell me that those don't occur. When we sit on the border, we're saying that we apprehend one about every four. I hope those aren't the same kind of numbers here. Because from what we've had in previous testimony, there's a lot of people carrying badges out there that we don't have any recollection of and who they are and background. Seriously, that's what was brought up in this, this committee. Um, what you have is under about 850,000 people who have criminal history background checks and terrorist uh, watch list checks, in addition to uh, other checks. And it's inadequate. That's because I can point to you that we take a grandmother and, and strip her down, who's in, because uh, it must be the grimacing that she is going through terminal cancer. And yet we also have another foreign national that gets through with a, um, um, an invalid um, uh, visa. The problem is, is, is that there's problems with that aspect because we're not nimble enough and we're not working associating with local and, and uh, regional communities better. And that needs to stop. Yeah, I I'm think out of time, sir. Good. Mr. Salmon, if you wanted to. No, no, I think, again, this effort, the tool which basically allows every airport in conjunction with the Federal Security Director to do that evaluation of what their vulnerabilities are because they are unique. There isn't one standard that applies across the whole country, but you take those standards, apply them based upon the vulnerabilities, uh, the, uh, the uh, attack scenarios that are possible at that airport, so on and so forth, for each airport to come up with an optimal solution so that every dollar that they have that they can apply to security they do it in the optimal way, the best way, the best bang for the buck for that particular airport. That tool exists. It's done in collaboration with the airports and the airport authorities. We had over 100 airports apply. Charlotte was not one of them. Uh, Charlotte is not particularly active in AAAE, which is a national organization which has security committees. They're not active in ACI, which is a national airport organization that has security committees. So all the people that worked on this, uh, Charlotte's name is not in there. So there are people who are working on this. As a matter of fact, on Monday, I had the CEO of Dallas-Fort Worth Airport fly in with his senior staff to sit down with John Pistol and our group to tell us that they were very happy working with TSA and what they wanted was to volunteer for any pilot security projects that they could have. 
that we would work with them on. So in terms of how the relationship with airports and working with local authorities, it may vary across the country, but there are a lot of them who put a lot of work into all these reports to get a tool that will enable them to do the best, most optimal security uh, um, assessments and reports and ways forward for each of their airports. Well, then it seems to me that you just told me that you, you want a nimble approach. So maybe Charlotte needs a little bit different uh, uh, TLC, and, and maybe that's what, what you need to look at, is that you're giving an individualized plan, so make sure that you're, you're elevating that to an individualistic plan as well. So, you know, be careful what you ask for there, okay? Just because somebody's complying, I mean, to give you an example, you know, as a teacher, a teacher only is asking you to, to re repeat what they want you to. It doesn't tell you about the knowledge about the, the, the student. You have to go a little bit further sometimes, and that's the exact case that I'm looking here, is that sometimes the squeaky wheel is actually the one that's doing something a little bit different that I want to know about. And I think that behooves you at the top to understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, as well as all the different other models. And that's why they, they, what we did was go beyond compliance with this report to get the best innovative security measures from airports around the country, because compliance I, is not sufficient. I agree. And, and we, we will probably have this ongoing discussion, but the idea that you haven't conducted joint vulnerability assessments in 83 percent of our nation's airports is not acceptable. It is just not acceptable. We need to figure out how to solve that, and I appreciate the follow-up of that. Uh, as it relates to Dallas, I would hope that Dallas would be with the first ones in here. They have had 20 perimeter security breaches in the last five years. They had a truck that actually came out across uh, the fields, as I noted in my opening statement. So there is a lot that needs to be done on security with such a, a big airport such as Dallas, for instance. Um, let, let me go back to the, whole, to the dogs here. My, my understanding of the dollars and the metrics here, and, I, and again, if we can't correct the record here as a follow-up, my understanding is it costs roughly about $175,000 per whole body imaging machine, but the dogs are something like twenty dollars to $30,000 to have a fully trained dog ready to go. Those aren't the numbers. Let's go ahead and correct the record, but I'm pretty darn sure that those are the records. But to Mr. Gosar's point, the whole body imaging machines have something that the dogs don't have. They have lobbyists. And what is infuriating to a person like me is I think the challenge is we got to increase the security. We have to become more secure, but we can't give up every civil liberty. We shouldn't be looking at every passenger naked in order to secure the airplane. What we do need are these good dogs, because the Pentagon, having spent $19 billion, came to the conclusion, as I pointed out with the, the, the uh, Lieutenant Colonel's uh, comments, the single best way to find a bomb-making device or bomb-making materials is the canine. And we are not putting enough emphasis on expanding the use of canines. They are friendly, they are non-invasive, they are effective. Um, they are the single best weapon, according to the Pentagon, in order to fight and find these explosive devices. So would you like a response? Sure. Um, in terms of the dogs you saw here, Con or, uh, the TSA supports the Amtrak program. In fact, we probably have supported up to about a third of the dog teams that Amtrak has. The dog, a fully equipped dog uh, team with training, trainer, dog, so on and so forth, is in the hundreds of thousand dollars because you don't, the dog doesn't. It does. You pay for the salary of the trainer. Per year? Uh, yes. Yes. You think that's per year? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, Let me ask excessive. Inspector Parker. No, no, hold on. It's Inspector excessive. Parker, can you give me a sense of just what does what a, uh, a dog handler make there at Amtrak? What, what's their annual salary? Do you have a guess of generally what they are making? Uh, depends on their rank. They are probably at uh, fifty to 70000 we so how do you come up with hundreds of thousands of dollars? We I mean, Alpo only costs so much. We so oversee the transit grant program where we provide dog teams to, to agencies around the country, and it is in excess of $100,000 that we provide. You said hundreds of thousands of dollars per dog. I challenge, you, I challenge you to verify that number. We will get you the numbers that we, that we Would the gentleman yield? agencies. Yes. Would the gentleman yield for just one second? Yes, sir. Mr. I assume that your whole body imaging machines require an operator, too, that requires a salary as well. They don't, it, it actually, in Corpus Christi, it requires at least two, actually yeah, three, one to stop you going through, one to listen on the radio, and the one in the back. That, so those, they require three operators for a whole body machine. They all require, they are all expensive systems. They each have the role. You have, you are suggesting that the whole body imaging machine is a cheaper alternative than using the canines. 
I'm telling you. I tell you what, let's do this. Let's do this. I would love to do this. Yeah. I would love to do this. You take a thousand people and put them in a room, I'll give you 10 whole body imagery machines. You give me 5,000 people in another room, you give me one of his dogs, and we will find that bomb before you find your, what? your bomb. That's the problem is there's a better, smarter, safer way to do this, and the TSA is not prioritizing it. And if you look at who those lobbyists were who pushed through those machines, they should be ashamed of themselves because there is a better way to do this, and it's with the canines. And I'm basing that based on what the Pentagon did. That's what the Pentagon did. They studied all the technology, all the information, and that's what they're doing. They are deploying. You don't see whole body imaging machines in Kandahar, but you do see dog teams. Because those guys, their people, their lives are on the line every day. That's what we should be doing. And I, you brought it up, and I will challenge you. Let's go look at dollar for dollar. What's more expensive, a whole body imaging machine, which we know is not effective, and a canine? Let's see who can find more bombs, and let's see who is less expensive. Let's move on. And the dog does not work all day. Thank you, Inspector Parker. How long does the dog work? Your microphone, please. The dogs can work to two to three hours a day, sir, and you take a break and then work two to three hours more is how you condition a dog to work. There, let's keep going because I, I really do believe that the dogs are, are a better, smarter solution. Um, one of the challenges that the TSA is having to deal with is the fact that we have over 900,000 security badges out there. My understanding is I was told there are roughly 16,000 just at Dulles Airport alone. What sort of background checks are they going through? How often are those rechecked? And how are you going to deal with the fact that we got closing in on a million people with security badges all across the, the airport? So there are probably 850,000 uh, badges out there that are active. Um, they go through a criminal history background check. Who, who does that check? The, that, that check is, is, it goes through the airport authority to AAAE to the FBI. Uh, then they do a watch list check, which goes through AAAE's right currently the channeling mechanism goes through TSA. We run a watch list check on them. They're perpetually vetted uh, from the watch list basis. Um, in addition, there are other uh, immigration checks on those people person when they originally apply. They are redone every two years, uh, and at that time, the uh, security awareness training is required at the time of the badge reissuance. Do you have a plan to deal with the vulnerabilities of an insider attack? In, there, is, uh, there are a number of things in terms of insider attacks, in terms of uh, uh, the security awareness training. No, but I'm saying, is there an actual plan? In terms of which, what particular kind of attack? Or an insider you, attack. Well, there are many, can take many forms. What kind are you thinking of? Well, I, I just wonder if there's a plan to deal with the fact that you have 900,000 people yes. who are, you do. There are Mr. Security Lord, exercises. what's your understanding of that situation? Our commentary was related to the uh, combined risk assessment, the so-called TISRA, the uh, latest edition released last year. A notable caveat was it excluded the threat of the insider uh, attack in various forms, and TSA acknowledged it needed to look at that, and the next iteration due later this year will include that threat. But Mr. Because Salmon just said he already has it. Uh, well, I'm not sure he meant in the terms of this one analysis I'm referring to. They may look at it in other forums. Or is Mr. Lord wrong, Mr. No, Salmon? two different things. Your question, as I took it, is what, is the, what goes on daily in an airport environment? Uh, the TIS is a, uh, the first of its kind across all modes risk comparison uh, based upon 500, excessive 550 attack scenarios. Insider attack was not part of the first one. It will be included in the second version. I look forward to seeing that. Uh, the 25,000 perimeter breaches, I would appreciate, is this, um, it's very difficult to get any sort of analysis of this over such a long period of time. Is there a month by month analysis that you can share with us? I don't have it with me. That's uh, 2,500 a year. It could be anything from a bag left behind, a door left open. And, and that's where we're, we're, yes. we're hoping that the TSA can provide us increasing details yes. and understanding which, where, where the trend going. Is this an upward trend, downward trend? Right. That sort of thing. Is that something you provide the committee? Uh, I will go back and uh, we'll check into that. Yes, sir. It's, yes, you will provide that to the committee. Um, in terms of its, if it's security sensitive material, we'll, we'll uh, talk to the committee about that. Yes. All right. Um, sorry, let me keep going. Um, the perimeter fence at the JFK Airport, um, based on an invest investigative report done by a news organization. Uh, my understanding is that the project to fix the perimeter fence is running four years behind schedule. What's your knowledge of that situation? Um, I'm not personally aware of that. I do know that JFK and the New York Port Authority airports are looking at employing, deploying 
uh, state-of-the-art intrusion detection technology uh, in addition to fencing uh, uh, because of the kinds of things that people have talked about, that fence can be cut. Uh, you want to have a technology tied into camera systems that will alert cameras and patrols if there is an intrusion. We deploy extensively in the subway tunnels intrusion detection in key tunnels, under, particularly underwater tunnels. I know. We are getting off topic here. I am worried about the, the quarter mile of fence at JFK and it I would being have four to, years behind schedule. I don't know right now today what uh, the status is, but we will get back what, to you. Please describe for the committee your, your role and responsibility. What is your responsibility? My responsibility is working with the various stakeholders, uh, various uh, people in pipelines, in mass transit, in railroads, in highways, in air. Uh, freight carriers, uh, generally. So it's not exclusive to just airports. No, sir. And would you say that JFK is one of the most? I mean, it's got to be one of the largest targets out there. JFK is. And I, I, the committee would appreciate more understanding from their perspective of why this project is four years behind schedule. I understand there's a local component, but from the TSA yes. uh, side, that would be uh, Happy much to that. much appreciated. A Los Angeles International Airport, uh, LAX. Uh, an airport official noted that although the current 8-mile perimeter fence complies with Federal regulations, it has been built in stages of the past decade and has no one consistent security standard. Is there a consistent security standard for perimeters? Um, the standard varies based upon uh, the location of the uh, facility. Uh, the base but it is not going to vary in an airport, right? Uh, it may vary between LAX and, and Bozeman, Montana. It may vary based upon whether the location of the airport is, what the surrounding geography is. is uh, are there standards for all those various components? Those standards are, again, what we have done, the work I showed the committee earlier this today in terms of developing what the, for each airport based upon their vulnerabilities, uh, but they do vary with an airport. Some parts are spent, Mr. some are Mr. not. Mr. Lord, what is your understanding of this situation? Uh, I will have to defer to Mr. Salmon on that, whether the standards vary within the actual airport. I'm not a, I don't have expertise. In 2009, the Government Accountability Office issued a report stating that TSA lacks, quote, a unified national st strategy, end quote. Where is that today? Well, first of all, that is a great question. At the time we did the work, we were concerned about the variety of players involved, multiple airports, multiple industry stakeholders. TSA had more of an indirect uh, oversight role, and we thought it was important to come up with an overall game plan to unify the current efforts. And it is our understanding of draft strategies currently uh, has been included as a modal annex to a uh, document called the uh, TISIP, but that is currently under uh, agency review. So they are close to releasing it. We have not seen it yet. Well, one more question, then I will recognize Mr. Ferenthal. Um, the software updates. Uh, as uh, Inspector Parker uh, pointed out, uh, the hardware needs software, and that software needs updating. Uh, some of this software is as old as 1998, is my understanding, based on what I have read. Is that your understanding of what is the agency doing to update the software? So as I understand, the all new equipment being purchased is being uh, purchased at the 2010 standard. The 1998 standards are uh, more stringent than anything in the world and that there is a plan to update incrementally machines that are out there uh, in phases to the 2010 standard. That is my understanding. Mr. Lord, do you care to comment on that? I, I agree with that characterization. So there are are you prioritizing the 1998 machines? Is there, is there a? We could. I'll have to get back to you with a specific plan to update those machines. I don't have that with me. All right. Let me go to Mr. Farenthold. Recognize. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity for a second round of questioning. Uh, again, I want to start with the actual topic. Uh, uh, we've kind of gone into a whole lot of areas here. Perimeter security. Um, once you're within the perimeter of the airport, there. To, a real potential of you being able to do some damage. Uh, what is being done to address the much more ease of access to the tarmac uh, area from those involved in general aviation as opposed to those in commercial aviation? For instance, I uh, drive into the general aviation area to board my friend's uh, private plane, and then I uh, wander over and sneak something on a plane. Uh, commercial plane. Um, first thing we've done about two years ago required extended the badging requirements to people in general aviation. That caused quite a fuss. Uh, there was a lot of uh, pushback on that. But, but uh, now there's no photo IDs for a pilot to, to access his 
his or her plane if he's, general a, if he's a if he's regularly on that airport he has to have a he has to have a badge yes sir if based upon wh where it is but if he has proximity to the tarmac the commercial airport and this caused quite a bit of a ruckus back in i think it was 2008 when we extended the badging requirements for larger populations within the airport but but i don't need a badge to go into get onto the tarmac in a general aviation area i don't need anything if you you what you you either have to be accompanied to your aircraft back and forth or um, in and out of that uh, facility, but uh, if you can be challenged just as anyone else on the facility, okay. if you were there. All right, Ned. It, it it seems like uh, again I, I'm just speaking from what appears to me to be common sense that there really ought to be a focus on the ground staff that doesn't go up in the airplanes. The 9/11 uh, box cutters. Uh, were potentially put on the plane by uh, by ground crew. Uh, the ground crew doesn't doesn't go up with the plane, so their life isn't at risk uh, in an attack. Uh, it seems like there ought to be uh, a strong focus there. Uh, that's why they are all badged and they have uh, security awareness training. That's why there's covert testing of those uh, uh, and random screening of people on the on okay. the tarmac, yes, sir. All right, and let's talk a little bit about the behavioral detection. You know, before I was elected to Congress, I actually had time to watch TV and watch the lie to me. Is this really a, a, a science that works, or is it a pseudoscience? You mentioned that we were able to apprehend hundreds of criminals. Have we seen any positive results of that in apprehending anybody with contraband at the airport? Um, we did. I believe it was in Orlando several years ago. A person had actually. Uh, uh, explosive material in his bags. He attempted to to uh, get them onto the belt. Uh, he was detected as he came through the door uh, with, with by his behavior. He had not been screened. His bags had not been screened. Uh, he was pulled over and found that he had a, uh, he was okay. attempting to get. So we've gotten bags. one. Mr. Well, Lord, did you want to comment I, on that? You know, I'd like to respectfully uh, disagree with Mr. Salmon on that. I, I'm not sure he was uh, detected through the uh, BDO program. He had such an unusual appearance. I think he alarmed the passengers waiting in line, and the ticket agent may have uh, alerted locals. So I'm not sure that was truly a BDO uh, behavior detection success. Also, as I recall from reading his case file, he was an Iraqi war veteran suffering from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and wasn't on his medication at the time. Let, let, let's, Mr. Ron, uh, so. would, would you like to comment on that? I know the Israelis were pioneers in this. <clears throat> yes. Um, the, um, in Israel, the uh, principle of behavior detection is part of a wider principle of uh, identifying level of risk a, um, of the individual passengers uh, and is also based on a, um, a looking at other sources of information rather than a uh, just observation. So you have to look at it in that context. But uh, I still have to say that the, uh, the um, BDO program, um, despite the fact that um, it has been uh, noted that the, uh, um, both by GAO and the Academy um, the, uh, a, uh, of Science that a, uh, there's no scientific support, but I need to say that there hasn't been a serious research into this. All right, so then. that by itself doesn't prove that it doesn't stand. In, ter in empiric terms, I think that a, uh, at least uh, those airports here in the U.S. that um, they, we have worked with on this uh, issue, mostly with local police uh, officers, there's been a, a reasonable level of success in detecting people with malicious intentions. Well, let me just ask you one more question, Mr. Ron. Uh, if for some reason I were to become president tomorrow and I appointed you uh, the head of the TSA, what are the top five changes you would make to improve security and improve the efficiency of the system? Do you, can, can you list maybe five off the top of your head? Well, I'll, I'll start with two. Uh, the first one is a, um, I would redirect the, uh, the uh, strategy towards a uh, risk-based real risk-based strategy that identifies the uh, level of risk of the individual passenger by the um, access to information that we have uh, starting with prior to his arrival, his or her arrival at the airport, uh, <clears throat> and later on um, the, uh, with the ability to talk to those uh, very few passengers that we find as high-risk passenger based on our earlier analysis and not just search them, but also talk to them and interview them to a level that would yeah. provide us with more uh, information. Yeah, yeah. It, it's really the, interesting. I, I did this just kind of as a thought experiment, and I'll, I'll, I'll just give me some. I walked, I went from Corpus Christi to Washington, D.C., without saying anything other than thank you to a person at the airport. That was a, a, 
no interaction beyond saying thank you to people who helped me. Yeah, this is a critical point because I think that the, uh, the lack of contact between uh, the uh, security <clears throat> between the security people and the passengers is one of our greatest shortcomings because we just uh, uh, focus on items and that is doomed to a failure because the technology that we have at this point is not good enough to provide us with a reasonable level of detection. I think we we'll now recognize Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Mr. Salmon, I just want to give you an opportunity to, to make some comments with respect to that. Uh, again, I do uh, don't disagree with uh, what Mr. Ron is saying. Uh, the first thing in terms of what he, the, key, the fundamental part is access to information, and that is uh, uh, the more information you have, the more you know about people, and you can say, because most of the people going through the airport in any given day are all are trusted. I mean, there's not a, there's, there's not a, uh, um, um, uh, they are fine. They just want to get on on their way. Uh, the, the challenge is to have information that differentiates people, one group of people or individuals from the, from the larger group. Uh, and getting that, as he said, uh, that information prior to the arrival at the airport. Uh, right now, we know is we know their name, we know their date of birth, and we know kind of where they're coming from, where they're going to. We can't even, through secure flight, track where they've been for the past three years. Uh, so it's a, uh, uh, right now we're in the situation of looking at how do we do um, uh, uh, better risk-based security, uh, but also what kind of information can you have access to to, to do a better job? And, it's, uh, uh, and that's one of the challenges. Oh. Thank you. Uh, just some very uh, quick things. Uh, the committee would appreciate the opportunity, particularly with Mr. Salmon here, to ask some additional questions. It would be all right that we submit those. Uh, I'd ask uh, all members of the panel, some of them weren't able to be here today, to submit those within the next uh, seven days. Um, we would also appreciate uh, the TSA providing us a copy of each of the incident reports. I know it's a massive amount of paper, but we would like to pour through those and we'd appreciate it if you would uh, provide those to us. Um, we would also like to have a briefing on this risk-based approach. It's something that you had offered earlier. I recognize it probably needs to be in a secure setting, um, but something we would like to schedule and, and work out with the TSA uh, moving forward. Um, I would also uh, appreciate some uh, definitions, if you will, and some specific statistics on the number of stowaways. It is something we have asked for. It is something the TSA has not yet provided to us, but this committee would appreciate those. Is there, of those things that I asked, is there any reason to think that, that can't, those things can't happen? Um, I will go back and check and make sure that they, uh, they, uh, the status of those requests and, and where they are. Uh, um, thank you. And a couple of those are new, so, but the, uh, the uh, stowaways is, it was a previous request. Um, last question here about transportation security inspectors, or TSIs, it is referred to in a lot of the documents. How many of them are there? And I know that they can impose civil penalties, so how many civil penalties have we imposed over the years? I don't know what time frame to ask, yeah. but. Uh, I think that would be a good request in terms of what we have. I don't have data with me today, so it would merely be conjecture on my part, uh, but we could give you the total number of inspectors that are out there um, and uh, the number of penalties, number of open cases. Um, there are also what we do in terms of findings. In some cases, the airport uh, on the spot resolves the issue. Uh, in other cases, they, go, they do go to uh, civil violations and civil fines and that kind of thing. But I think it would be good to get you a good breakout on that that is that's, uh, that's that's concise and accurate. We, we would appreciate that. As we conclude here, I would like to give you just each a moment, please, brief. Um, but we will start with you, Mr. Salmon, kind of go down the line. What is the kind of number one thing you would like to see happen, uh, whether it is your biggest concern or what, what specific you would like, like to see happen? And then we will close the hearing. Um, I, again, with the committee and all committees in Congress, is to uh, support and work with Administrator Pistol as he goes forward with risk-based security. Uh, he is uh, definitely focused in that direction, and uh, it's going to take. Uh, there are going to be challenges, as we referred to, in terms of information. Uh, how do we go forward? But he definitely is going in this direction, and I would uh, say to give him the benefit of the doubt and work with him in terms of where he's trying to go. I would just like to say on behalf of GEO, we stand ready to support the committee's efforts to oversee TSA's effort to move more to more of a risk-based approach. I agree with Mr. Ron. We need to spend more time worrying about dangerous people versus dangerous objects, and there's various ways to do it, and we need to do it in a way that makes sense. I'd like to note <coughs> that our, both of our joint vulnerability assessments noted no compliance issues. We were in full compliance with all of the regulations. 
Uh, what I would like to see is a collaborative uh, partnership between us and the TSA to address the real issues. Thank you. Mr. Ron. Uh, beyond the uh, need for a uh, better risk-based approach a, uh, to passenger and back screening, I would strongly recommend to uh, create a better balance between the airport facility security um, the, uh, and the uh, passenger and back screening operation, because right now um, we are spending uh, most of our efforts on the front door when the back door is not secured at all. Thank you. Inspector Parker. Yes, sir. Thank you. I would like to see continued support for the K-9 programs because, as stated before, that Amtrak is doing a lot, and we definitely appreciate what Congress has done for us to fund us. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. This takes a lot of time and effort and preparation of your testimony uh, and for you being here today. Uh, we do appreciate it, uh, and, and thank you and wish you the best. Our mutual goal on both sides of the aisle is to make this country as safe and secure as possible, but at the same time, we need to make sure that, uh, uh, that we're filling those gaps and asking the hard country, asking the hard questions. That's what makes this country great is our ability.